Hello, my name is Keshwani. It's K-E-S-H-W-A-N-I, Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for SAT. We have been solving SAT math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the SAT. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The problem that you're about to solve is the one, rather are the ones, that you will find on page number 399. Page 399. Please turn to it. The very first, you have to have the book in front of you. Turn to page 399. Make sure you read the problem with me. The very, very first one says, when a positive integer k is divided by 7, the remainder is 6. The very first thing we need to do here is to think of such a number so that when you divide it by 7, the remainder is 6. For example, 42 divided by 7. How many times 42 goes into 7? This goes 6 times because 7, 6 are 42. Is that the answer? Is, is, k, is, is k equal to 42? Does k equal to 42? The answer is no. The answer is no. This is not what we call remainder. Remainder, remainder is so called because it, it is what remains at the end. The remainder here is zero. This is the remainder. Many a times I have seen kids confuse this concept with this one which is called quotient. 6 is the quotient, 6 is not the remainder. We have to think of a number which when divided by 7 is going to give us a leftover of 6. Well, there are a couple of ways we can do that. There are a couple of ways we can take care of it. For example, we know we can divide 70 by 7 evenly. Therefore, if you were to add 6 to it, that 76 divided by 7 will have a 10 and a remainder of 6. You can make it even simpler. The simplest number that you can think of that will have a remainder of 6 when divided by 7 is simply is simply take the number and just add the remainder. That's it. Now we know for a fact that we will have a remainder of 6 because 7 divided by 7 is just 1. 7 goes even into 7. Everybody knows that. And therefore if you were to add 6 to it, that's what you can have left over. 13 divided by 7 equals 1 remainder 6. So that's our k here. Let's put in 13 for k. We're not going to put 76 because when you put in numbers, when you plug in numbers, well, that's what we're doing here. We're plugging in numbers for k. When you're plugging in numbers, you want to keep your numbers as small as possible. The smaller the number, the less work you will have to do. The less calculation you will have to do. So that's it. Our k is, 7, our k is 13. So so now it reads, so now it does not read k, we're going to replace k with 13. Now it reads, when a positive integer 13 is divided by 7, the remainder is 6, which is true. The question simply is, what's going to be the remainder when you divide k plus 2 by 7? By 7. k plus 2 would be 13 plus 2, which is 15. 15 divided by 7 is same as... 14 plus 1 divided by 7, which of course is just 2, remainder 1. 15 divided by 7 will have a remainder of 1. That's it. That's your answer. Answer is B. Let's look at 12. In 12, we are given a chart. It looks something like this. There is our depth, there is the pressure. 0, 15, 30, and 45. The very first thing we should notice is that as the depth, as the depth goes up, so does the pressure. In other words, the relationship is positive between the two variables. When one variable goes up, so does the other which means the slope of this line, if we were to draw, 
applied the pressure versus the depth, the slope has to be positively slow. The slope has to be positive, the line has to be positively sloped. So here we have 14, 21, 28, and 35. So let's look at A. So first of all we need a positively sloped line. What's wrong with answer choice A? Answer choice A we can cross out immediately because it is negatively sloped. The line is negatively sloped. What they're saying there is that as the depth goes up, pressure goes down. No, that's not what we have here. As the depth goes up, as the depth goes up, so does the pressure. They're moving in the same direction. A is negatively sloped line, so is B. B is negatively sloped. A is wrong, B is wrong. What's wrong with C? Is C okay? C is positively sloped. But what does the graph show here? The graph shows here that when depth is zero, when depth is zero, when depth is zero, the pressure is also zero because it starts at origin. It says when depth is zero, pressure is zero. Is that what we see here? No. We do not see there. When depth is zero, pressure equals 14. What we have is something like this. Here is our depth on the x-axis. So when depth is zero, at zero depth, we have some pressure here. This part right here, from here to here, is 14. Let me put it a little bit bigger so we can see it. What we have here around our head, this is our depth, this is our pressure, and it starts like this. And this part from here to here, we are told it's 14. Here, depth is 0 and pressure is 14. Right here. When depth is 0, pressure is 14. That's not what this shows. This shows that it starts at origin. Even though it has a right slope, it has a positive, positive slope, but it doesn't show the right combination of depth and pressure. C is wrong. Let's move on to D. Let's move on to E. What does E say? At this point here, is, is some, there is some value for depth here, let's call it D. At certain value of depth, the pressure is zero. Where is pressure zero? I don't see any zero pressure in, at any depth. Pressure happens to be 14 even at a depth of zero. By the way, what does, it, what does the depth of zero mean in this context? A depth of zero in this context simply means at sea level. We are at sea level. Even when you are at sea level, there is some air pressure. There is some barometric pressure. And as you go deeper in the, she, in the sea, the pressure rises. But this one says pressure is zero at certain depth. No, no. Even at zero depth, the pressure is positive. E is wrong. The only graph that shows the proper combination is D. Alright here, that's your D. That's, that's the graph D here. That's it. All the others do not make sense. Of course all the others do not make sense because we can't have more than one right answer. Let's look at 13, shall we? Number 13. It says first term of the sequence of the number is 1. All right. First term is 1, in each term after the first term is the product of negative 2 and the term preceding it. Okay, let's read one more time. Each term after the first term, and we already told what the first term is, first term is 1. Each term after that is negative 2 times the term preceding it. The term preceding it was 1 here. So which means the second term is negative 2, because it's negative 2 times the term preceding it, which is negative 2. What about the next one? Again, it's going to be negative 2 times the term preceding it, which is this guy right here. So it becomes negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4. And then the one after that is going to be negative 2 times positive 4, and negative 8. So that's what we have here. We have 1, 
negative 2, positive 4, negative 8. What is the question asking? What is the sixth term? Oh, I stopped too early, didn't I? So we have the fourth term now. So the fifth term is going to be, let's put them one more time here. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. The fifth term is going to be, so we have 1, negative 2, positive 4, negative 8. And the next one is going to be negative 2 times negative 8, which comes from here. Negative 2 times negative 8 is positive 16. And the sixth term is going to be sixth term is going to be negative two times sixteen. Again, one more time. The rule is that each term after the first term is negative two times the preceding term. Whatever the term before that was, whatever the term was right before it, you take that amount multiplied by the negative 2 and that's your new term and once you have that new term the next one after that is going to be negative 2 times the term before that that's so on so it's negative 2 times 16 which gives us negative 32 negative 32 answer choice is let's do the last one on the page shall we number 14 number 14 2x minus 5 times 2x plus 5 equals 5. Well, the very first thing we should do is open this parenthesis and see what happens. 2x times 2x is 2x squared. Then we have 2x times positive 5. 2x times positive 5. Then we're going to have negative 5 times 2x. And then finally we're going to have negative 5 times a positive 5. And all of that we are told equals 5. All of that equals 5. So here we get 4x squared. 2x plus a 5 gives us 10x. Negative 5 times 2x is going to give us negative 10x. And here we're going to have negative 25. A positive 10x and a negative 10x is going to cancel out. And we, what we're left with is 4x squared minus 25. Equals 5. Equals 5. And the question is simply asking, the question is simply asking us what's the value of 4x squared. 4x squared is right there. Let's add 25 to both sides. And this 25 cancels out. And we're left with 4x squared equals 30. And that's all there is. That was the end of that page. I'm not going to go to the next page. We're going to stop right here. We'll, we'll, we'll meet again tomorrow. Okay? I'll see you tomorrow. Bye now.